Hello, everyone. Welcome back, or, or maybe for the first time. Uh, if it is the first time, a special welcome to everyone who decided to check this out. Um, we've been doing these since late March. This is number 24. Uh, we've done the most every week on Friday. Uh, and uh, this all formed around the question, what is a library if the building is closed? That was a, kind of a self-evident question in, in late March. And it led to a whole array of uh, interesting topics and even more interesting speakers and presenters, two of which we have today. Uh, we did this in rounds. The first round was kind of, you know, what's going on? And then we began to kind of organize around the notion of libraries in response. Okay, there are all these things happening. What are libraries doing? to cope with that and how they're helping their communities cope with what was going on. Uh, and then last week, we initiated a kind of round three, we would call it libraries and recovery. So starting to think beyond just responding and coping, but what's, what's the future gonna be like for communities, society at large, and then what are the role of libraries in that, in both the creation of that and the response to that. And, and so, uh, we kicked that off last week. We had uh, Vint Cerf, uh, the co-father of the internet, uh, Crosby Kemper, the IMLS director, and David Lankus, who heads the, uh, the information school at the University of South Carolina, uh, in a panel that kind of kicked that off. It was, it was really interesting. Uh, it is recorded, as these all are, and posted on the uh, pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. I'll have that link up in a second. So this is also being recorded now and we'll have it up in a, in a day or two. And if you're interested, you can watch it again or you can send somebody else there and let them have a look at it. So um, uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We've been producing these, as I said, since late March. These are being hosted and recorded by uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, our longtime ally in the campaign for public access. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, soon as a uh, new declaration has been, uh, is being finalized right now, basically saying that everyone should be near a public access point. Uh, our speakers today, we'll get back to them. Kelvin Watson, the director of Broward County Library, is returning uh, to us from, I think it was July or June, Kelvin, can't remember, but welcome back. And then me. for the first time, uh, Graham Richard, uh, uh, a longtime colleague and a, a, a thought leader uh, in a whole range of uh, topics. Uh, Graham was uh, uh, noted as the uh, America's broadband mayor when he was uh, in Fort Wayne. So, uh, as I said, public public access uh, is a is a campaign that that this is what libraries do every day is provide public access to the public, uh, open to anyone uh, to log on to the library's uh, uh, link to the internet or, of course, the link to the library's own digital services, uh, which are uh, even more important than ever now uh, in the pandemic. Uh, here's an example of one of these kind of stations in a, in a, uh, uh, a recreational area in Manhattan, Kansas. You're in a library access zone. Welcome, log in. And we think this is a, a, a great way for libraries to extend themselves out into their community as a, as a physical presence of the library, even though it's a, a digital access, it's a place, it's a zone defined by the range of Wi-Fi, which is most of us know is, you know, 50 meters, something like that. And so not just an open link, an open AP to the internet, but it should be a, a, a library a welcome page, a splash page for the library saying, you know, welcome, what would, where would you like to go? The open internet? Would you like to browse our, our collections? Would you like to speak to a librarian? Would you want to go to this the city government uh, uh, services, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and a great way for uh, libraries to extend themselves across their community 
And what we found is that people tend to discover things about the library. I mean, this is a recurring theme, right? I didn't know they did that. Well, this is one way to help them discover that you do do that. And uh, then they start coming and they did start coming to the library for these various kinds of services that you offer. Uh, this would be another idea, actually go out and, you know, it's a kind of a, a librarian version of a bookmobile. You have a, a library station out there and maybe somebody, maybe a librarian shows up, you know, once a week and helps people, answers questions. It's just a thought. Um, uh, very timely, this is an article yesterday in New York Times, beyond the pandemic, libraries look toward a new era. So very timely with our, our focus here is looking forward in preparations. Excellent article. Uh, I've just grabbed some of the, some of the points out of it. Some are quotes from uh, the librarians that are quoted and some are just part of the article. But this is, you know, this is kind of what, what is being talked about. Will virtual eclipse physical? Uh, we don't know yet. We know that physical is, is majorly handicapped by the, by the dictates of the virus. But at the same time, libraries are continuing to distribute uh, physical materials, curbside. Larry told us all about that. If you haven't seen that uh, hysterical video, uh, just search for curbside Larry and you'll get, a, you'll get a kick out of it. But you know, picking up uh, uh, and, and dropping off services, libraries are beginning to open a little bit, reorient their space. But the, the digital services have skyrocketed. Uh, in, the, in the last six months as people are both uh, restricted to the digital services in a lot of cases and are you know, looking for ways to save money as a lot of people are challenged right now. And people like the choice. Uh, and this one is the libraries are now people-centered instead of collection-centered. I'm not sure that's new, but you know, that was one opinion that was expressed. And then this one, they did a, a survey, you'll see, and they ranked the, uh, the, the services. Uh, and these are not all of them, but I thought they were interesting because they seem to align with what we've been talking about. Decentralized space, more pop-up books, mobiles, low-touch kiosks, which we've just seen and, and are advocating for because they're so inexpensive, low-cost, high-value presence of the library in the community. Mm -hmm. And then this last one. Just started. Is absolutely oh, started relevant. at 11. Oh, that's right. Stop it. That uh, I earlier. Somebody mute, please. Eric, maybe that's you. Would you, Eric, please mute. Uh, and then given the country is tearing itself apart, perhaps the libraries can help repair our civic fabric. If anyone can, I believe if we're looking for an institution, it's got to be our public libraries. So uh, don't shy away. So here we go. Uh, Kelvin, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, we had scheduled you to be on. I believe it was like... Uh, like three weeks before the, uh, the Floyd killing. Mm -hmm. and, and we put you on the spot, basically, as a black man to kind of talk about the reality of that. And you just held forth with just some amazing perspective and adv advising libraries not to assume that just because they're open to all that they really are free of biases. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I thought that was a tremendous uh, perspective. And I hope everybody took that to heart. Um, but more, we're actually interested in, well, as well, let me put it that way, as well, we're, we're interested in, you know, what you've been doing over the past few months, what kind of changes have you been seeing and how, how does what you're experiencing now, uh, focus and, and create a context for you to think longer term. Nobody is really expecting this virus to disappear in, the, in December or maybe even December of 2021. We're negotiating with it and we're doing, we're discovering what it will let us do. Maybe there'll be a vaccine, maybe it'll be effective, but it'll be a long time before that's pervasive enough to be anything like what we used to call normal. Uh, I, I think one, uh, one librarian said, it's not, the, it's not the new normal, it's the next normal. And it'll be something different, but it'll, you know, as humans are, we're very adaptive and we'll, we'll normalize about around almost anything. Uh, so 
what's what's your thinking on what's coming and and uh, you know where do, where do we where do we go and and then we'll turn it over to Graham after that. And let me stop okay. screen share here. All right, thanks, Don, um, and uh, welcome back, everyone. And um, I'm glad to join you again. So um, I just wanted to cover a few thoughts, put a few thoughts together, um, and. Um, Thanks for mentioning that article, uh, Don, that came out yesterday. A lot of my colleagues, um, you know, communicated, you know, what they were doing and how things were. And actually, I, you know, I had already put my notes together. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, specifically to those things. But with COVID-19 and its am impact on all of our lives, uh, we at Broward County Libraries recognize that we continue to be the center of culture. Um, not just for consumption and instruction, but that we are the people's university and that we have to uh, plan accordingly. Um, and so in recovery, um, we've had to reimagine and, and redesign um, for a changed society, a changed interaction with, uh, with the customers that use our library. So we we're planning to move into our reopening uh, process. Our library locations have been open, but not specifically uh, physically to the public. Uh, we've been um, uh, providing curbside service, walk-up service. Uh, we have over the past few uh, months actually um, stockpiling PPE um, so that we are prepared when the, the libraries uh, physically open again. We've prepared our buildings. I have 38 library locations here in Broward County. We serve approximately 1.9 million um, you know, people, uh, and that doesn't count the visitors and, and, and others who make their way to, uh, you know, to South Florida. So in preparation of our, uh, our buildings, we now somewhat resemble what you might experience in a retail environment and other establishments. We've got plexiglass at our service points, at our circulation desk, um, at our mobile uh, library service points as well. We've got floor signage, um, letting people know to stay six feet away uh, from each other. We've got um, other things to rope off areas, um, lots of additional uh, self-service kiosks that are available um, and will be available for people. Um, we've removed seating. Uh, we've spaced out our tables. Um, we also, um, have fewer tables and chairs in some cases in, in, in different buildings. We actually went in and looked at each one of our locations so that we could figure out with our facilities folks how we could be prepared um, based on the size and space what we needed to do. So in some cases we've removed tables, some cases we've actually added tables. Over the last few months since um, in Broward County, we didn't furlough any of our staff. We had all of our staff working. As you can see, I'm here in my office. I've been here pretty much every, Monday through Friday, every day since, since March. Um, did take a few days off, but pretty much I've been here every, uh, every day. So we, because we, we took advantage of, of COVID and we did a physical inventory of our two point, our two million items we actually took on a tremendous weeding project, which allowed us to then remove some shelving here at the main library, for example. And we replaced where the shelving used to be. We now have some spread out seating. Um, we have um, also prepared our computers, uh, our cybraries uh, for the public. And as well as we did some things in our staffing area to actually uh, have them be uh, six feet apart. Uh, or if there was three uh, computers, the one in the middle is now off, off limits. And again, you've probably seen some of this, um, you know, what they're doing and how they're preparing schools and uh, certainly in restaurants and other places. So um, for a while, when we open, um, and I'm anticipating our opening will be in the next few weeks um, as we, as the county begins to open, um, we will temporarily uh, continue with no meeting room reservations. We're going to only use single study carols that will be available, but any, any, anywhere where people congregate, we won't be making that available. Um, we're also going to be uh, also going to 
um, have no physical periodicals and magazines and newspapers. We've replaced uh, those with preloaded tablets, which will bring our customers to digital magazines that we offer and, the, and newspapers. So essentially we, we didn't spend $200,000 on magazines for this this year um so we've diverted that those funds to uh, more digital resources as we um as, as don pointed out who knows when this thing is going to change or how we're going to change but we need to be prepared with more virtual resources we're going to continue with our um virtual conferences we actually did our soft florida book festival online we had over 1500 people attend we're actually doing a conference right now today is a our conference on children's literature is taking place right now and we've got a couple hundred people who've uh, participated in that and i've been i'll be popping in and out throughout the day we're going to continue with our curbside and walk-up service that we started in june since june we've had over fifty-seven thousand people used as service so as the article yesterday pointed out we do have people continually checking out physical resources um we have um uh, we're going to be launching uh within the next week our curbside mobile printing where our customers will be able to send us their print jobs and we'll execute them and then we'll make them available for them to pick those uh print jobs up we're going to be printing uh you know for making 20 uh copies or prints available to you um uh daily uh that's your that that'll be your your limit we're going to be um, continuing with our uh, school support. We've, we've uh, had a partnership uh, that, uh, that increased our digital resources to the Broward County Schools about three years ago when I got here. To date, I, got a, I received a report yesterday, we've got 77,000 students so far who have their digital direct library card, which actually connects their, them to the digital resources here at uh, here at the public library. So that'll continue. Um, we have, con we, we've started a, uh, and enhanced our workforce development program. We just purchased um, some new uh, tablets um, for that program to help as, as we open up, we're going to help, uh, you know, get tablets into people's hands so that they can apply for jobs and where they won't necessarily have to come into the library to do those that thing, those things. We'll, we'll actually lend those out to them. Um, we've increased our, our spend in digital books and audio books. Um, we've also uh, bought some new materials, which are uh, immersive uh, virtual reality resources for kids um, so that um, for parents who are, you know, still going to be having their children at home, that they'll be able to, you know, take advantage of those um, as well. We, we've, we've developed great partnerships with our museums here in the community. Um, our Museum of Discovery Science, um, we're offering their, their uh, programming, they're offering our programming. So partnerships are going to definitely be a, a, a way for us to increase the library's visibility, but also the visibility of our partners. The Black Business Chamber of Commerce, Commerce here in Broward County, we, we've, uh, we've been doing a lot of entrepreneurial um, programming online and um, those will be continuing it as well. Um, our library statistics, we've had um, a 22% increase over our digital resource circulation. Um, and then, and that continues to trend um, over the past few years. We've been somewhere around 20 to 30 percent increasing. So that you know, people who uh, weren't familiar with digital resources, we've introduced them to those resources. And you know, the last thing uh, that I'll say um, is that uh, as a as a wrap, you know, what I've what I've seen is that with uh, with the online and virtual programming, we've, extend, we've expanded our reach uh, virtually. Um, we started working and putting and, and, and talking about our programs. Uh, we, we subscribe to PR Newswire now. So we actually are 
taking our programming here that was essentially primarily focused on South Florida, where you know this this audience now I'm able to reach nationwide, uh, also you know even into into Canada, North America, where people are actually uh, learning and and able to participate in you know the Broward County Library Services, and you know as I mentioned the last time that we that we spoke. Broward County Libraries, and, 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 and Don has known me and worked with me for the past few years, you know, we had a focus on virtual programming, you know, virtual library services outside our library walls. And certainly we're going to continue that with our library programming, uh, our library uh, books that we have. The, we have pop-up libraries on buses. We we provide library services outside at our parks locations here in, in Broward. Um, right before the pandemic hit, we had just launched um, a, uh, an online library to support our cruise uh, ships uh, staff as they would come off the cruise ships. We had launched a service to support them. And last year, uh, last summer, we launched our, uh, our airport location at the Hollywood uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport. So we're going to continue doing those things um you know there's going to be a mix as as is mentioned in the article yesterday of services now virtually or virtual services as well as uh, physical services so the hybrid model is definitely going to be something that uh libraries will continue to do as we uh continue to serve our our communities uh, so I, I thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Uh, Don, you need to unmute. Excuse me, pardon me. Uh, that's great, Kelvin. Uh, inspiring stuff. Great uh, that you are, you know, beyond the walls, uh, out in the community in all kinds of ways. Uh, it sounded like you said that your demand for e-materials is has gone up more or less the same way it had been going up, but at like twenty plus percent, not mm -hmm. not the fifty or hundred percent that we've heard from other libraries. Is that is that fair? I would say um, ours is true, but as I as I mentioned, um, we had already taken such a uh, a huge investment in our um, virtual and digital services and our promotion of our digital services that essentially we're still seeing you know overall a, a twenty two percent increase in some particular areas though, for example, in our children's services, if you isolate that particular, uh, you know, those particular digital resources, we, we've, we've seen probably nearly a 60% increase in that particular area. But mm -hmm. overall, in general, our, we, we're still seeing consistent, you know, 20 plus percent overall usage of those, uh, those, those e-resources. So you made the point that you're saving some money over here and you're spending more money over there. You're saving money on uh, the, the magazine prescription uh, subscriptions, but you're spending it more maybe on tablets. Do I understand though that that means you have digital subscriptions to those magazines that you can load onto those tablets? Yes, so we have been offering digital magazines for nearly the, fa the past five years. So essentially, you could do it via via an, the an app. Um, so there's a there's a several digital uh, magazine services out there. One was with uh, Zenio. Not that I'm trying to promote these services, but there's Zenio, and then there's an Absco product as well. Now we're going to make you know access to those easier by actually having those apps preloaded on the tablet so that when you come in, you can just read it from the tablet. Um, and then that, that way we can keep down any, um, you know, any issues that we're going to have from, you know, you, you've been to the doctor's office and other places and libraries, you know, so you know, you know what uh, those physical magazines go through. So we're, we're, we're going to try to limit that <laughs> from happening and not, and not make those available. Not that five-month-old New Yorker. Huh? Uh, one, one important point I think you were talking about that, that uh, brings up a question related to uh, uh, 
uh, you know, you're, you're initiating remote print, you're initiating uh, physical checkout, they're increasing your curbside services. Well, I'm presuming that those are all done online or, you know, so what about the people that don't have connections? How are they now accessing library services like, uh, well, like checking out a book? How do they, how do they know about a book? How do they find a book to even ask for? Yeah, so certainly um, it's, it's, it, there is a challenge with, you know, in our, in, in our communities with the, with the folks who are, you know, who don't have uh, those digital resources, uh, you know, able to go online and reserve a book, for example. But we do have, such, you know, we do have um, a, a new a mobile app that we launched, actually. Uh, this spring where you're able to reserve your materials via your phone. Um, now, we, we do know that uh, most people have a phone. And so that's one way that we're doing it. We also communicate it via, um, via multiple and numerous press releases. And, you know, our, 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 our television news stations is, have also done a, a good job of promoting our, you know, what you can do here in, in the library um, and the newspapers, you know, physical newspaper, digital newspaper as well. Um, so that's how we got it out. And if you need to reserve something and you don't have those, you, we still have the traditional way of calling the library. We have a library who will, uh, who will, uh, who will assist you and, uh, in making that, in making that happen. So, you know, there are ways that, uh, that we're able to do that, uh, Don, but as you pointed out, that there is also still a gap of people who we aren't able to reach because of of the digital di divide, and that certainly is a is a challenge, um, not just for Broward County libraries, but for all libraries, all libraries in trying absolutely. to uh, in trying to figure out the you know how to uh, how to get get over that. But you know, with what's happening with schools and um, you know and other um, you know schools are now opening, you know. It, it just takes a, it just takes more communication, more marketing, more getting out there. You know, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting as, as you guys, um, I wasn't planning on mentioning this, but I'll mention it. The census, um, you know, is the deadline for the census is next is next week. So we, we were one of the American Library Association's many grant uh, awardees. And of course our library buildings are closed. Uh, in our, we had prepared, planned on doing pull-up banners to promote the census here in the libraries. So what my, so what I decided was that since the libraries are closed, we're going to still create the pull-up banners, but we're going to put them in places where people are going. We put them in grocery stores because the stores are still open to promote the census, to promote the library. We also put them at where people are going to pick up food, for example. There's all, you know, the food, um, um, the people who are giving away food to people who are in need. We promote it. We put the banners <laughs> in those locations. So the idea that the library was the only place to put these is, again, uh, in my mind, a misnomer because you can put the library anywhere and, com and promote and communicate as you, as you see fit. But that's it. Again, that's an example of, you know, figuring it out yeah. <laughs> is what I, yeah, you know, that, that out. Yeah, if there was actually a motto behind open to all, it's figuring it out, you know. <laughs> uh, because the, the thing about libraries that, you know, as kind of the Swiss army knife of institutions, have every kind of circumstance and every kind of person, you know, to deal with. And it's just impossible to make rules for everything. They just, they just you know, can't cover it all it finally gets down to the judgment of a librarian on how to do a certain thing, you know, and, and figuring it out how to, you know, what's, what's appropriate, what's required, what do they need? How can I help them? And it's just an amazing uh, process. Having been a library uh, trustee, you know, kind of getting in as well, what do we do when somebody comes in, you know, they, they haven't taken a bath and all that. Okay. Well, how do we, do we make a rule? Okay. But does that work on this and that? So it just doesn't apply in enough places where it just has to come down to the librarian's judgment and, you know, some guidelines, of course. And so it's just amazing. Uh, but you mentioned this kind of civic responsibility or civic participation and related to the census. And that suggests because the seed will probably get back to this one, but uh, uh, voting, right? So, registration and actual voting. Uh, do you have plans to support 
voter registration or actual voting? Uh, do or libraries, uh, uh, you know, voting places? Yes. So we've got here in in, in Broward County um, about thirteen of our locations will be our our voting precincts. So we had our um, we had the um, uh, the primaries in August, and we we had library locations open to uh, for voting then, and in, our voting starts. Uh, started yesterday here in, in South Florida. Uh, so we are going to have, um, uh, as I said, about 13 precincts uh, available for voting. Um, and so that, that, there we have it. So we're, we're, we're there, we're helping, we're, um, you know, you won't be able to do anything else uh, unless we're open, open, but you will be able to, to uh, exercise your right to vote if you decide to do that, you know, in person. Great. Uh, I'm sure we're going to return to this. I think it's a huge topic right now more than ever where the whole system is being exposed as highly vulnerable, extremely ambiguous, and the level of distrust is off the charts. And the idea that libraries can play a role in restoring trust to the voting process maybe should not be uh, uh, overlooked. And I, and so I think I think we've got a subject for a new program coming up. Uh, Kelvin, we're gonna we're gonna keep moving here. There okay, are some good. questions in the chat. If yeah, I'll answer some of those and maybe respond to some of those. Yep. And so thank you. And uh, we'll maybe have some open questions. If we have time at the end, but not right now. I'd like to turn it over to Graham Richard. Uh, Graham, you're you're still with us. I am. Thank Very you. Very good. Well, welcome for the first time. It's great to have you. Thank Graham, you. Graham is an amazing fellow. I mean, his, we, I could spend the, next, the rest of the hour just talking about the things that Graham has done, but I won't do that because I want to have him talk about what he's thinking about these days is relevant to our topic of, of rethinking, reimagining, reinventing the, the library in, uh, in a new world. So Graham, thanks for being on and, and take it away. Well, thank you. And I want to compliment Kelvin and his outstanding leadership. Kelvin, thank you so much for your comments. And I'm going to, if you don't mind, um, uh, platform a bit off of those comments uh, for, for my comments. I want to start by, Don, expressing a bias. I think it's important that I, in full disclosure, tell you that I absolutely love libraries and I love librarians. And I want, I want you to know that bias up front. Accept it. Um, Noted. My, um, this started at a young age. I remember my mother, who was the founder, co-founder of the Friends of the Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, coming home one day when I was a little too young to fully understand, and she was literally dancing in the kitchen because she'd just gotten a phone call um, saying uh, that Alex Haley was going to be the next speaker at the Friends of the Library session in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which was a big deal. Um, so in 2000, I became the mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And what I'd like to do, and I'm gonna share a few slides, I'd like to both reprise a little bit of what we did to promote the services of libraries um, in the eight years that I was mayor, but of course, the library being around for 150 years, uh, had been doing great work prior to my having the opportunity to be mayor. And I, I want to just start and frame this with a bit of a challenge to all of us who care uh, and love libraries and librarians with, with this potential um, transformational period coming out of a pandemic and perhaps one of the greatest recessions uh, that we've ever seen. What's the way in which a library with its highest level of trust in almost all opinion studies, how can the leaders of libraries and libraries provide a leveraging of that trust to be at the table convening virtually now in most cases uh, those who are working to build back, recover, be resilient in this account. So that's the question I'm posing. And I'm going to give some specific examples 
around how we frame and think about what we do and how that can advantage the library. Just as Kelvin has, has indicated, he's now got you know, an international audience because of the capability of access to what he's offering for anybody that you know, has an internet connection. And so let me just uh, pull up uh, the slides and as I go through this a little bit, um, I'm gonna do a little screen share here and um, kind of tell the story of Fort Wayne if I might. Um, see if I can get that to open up here for us. Well, let's see, Don, is that coming up? Not yet, uh, that green button at the bottom of the of the uh, Zoom page. Okay, thank you. That's what I needed right there. So let's go to our slideshow view, getting my technology in place here for us. Not yet sharing though, Graham. It's not yet sharing. Well, let's push share again and there see if it works. Work. Okay, yep. good. <laughs> well, what I wanted to do was just share a little bit about um, the way we thought uh, and the way leaders mm -hmm. in our community thought about how broadband and the libraries become anchors for community support and even economic development. And so um, as an example, um, let's see if I can get it to click here. So what, what we, what was so uh, engaging for us was to rethink our libraries. This is examples almost two decades ago of how we rethought engagement even back then of kids with the digital environment having fun with the classic reading environment. And so kind of keep that in your frame of reference as we move on. Fort Wayne, just for those, everybody knows where Broward County is. You may not know where Fort Wayne, Indiana is. Uh, we're equal distant between Detroit, Indianapolis, second largest city, metro area of 500,000, uh, Allen County, uh, 370,000 the city, about 265. Um, as I mentioned, second largest city, we have our roots dating back to the confluence of three rivers. And this was an outpost of a fort that General uh, Washington sent uh, Matt Anthony, General Wayne, unfortunately, to conquer the territory from the Indians. Uh, but that's how we got our name Fort Wayne. Uh, we're a city of significant parks and ob obviously uh, now uh, technology as well as a wonderful library system. So one of the things that I would share is if you can continue to think about how you can leverage the talent, the teams, the technology, and most importantly, the trust in a community, that will be critical. And as we see trillions of dollars that will start to come to every community in this country, and that it will be labeled, as it already is, infrastructure investment. But there's a tendency for political leaders to get focused on traditional infrastructure. And what we did then, and I would suggest now, libraries, broadband, and critical job creating services will be where a library can be a leader in the community. We can talk more about that in a minute. But it's this frame of reference that most local elected officials need to be reminded that broadband and libraries are critical infrastructure as the new federal stimulus dollars come to us. You know, there's great opportunity. It's, it, the library can be the hub, the center of the community. You can leverage the high trust relationships. Uh, Kelvin's already talked about some wonderful public-private partnership he's got. I want to share a few other ideas as we move along in our discussion. This is something that we kept emphasizing with our library board. By the way, in our case, the mayor had no appointments to the library board, and yet I was the only elected public official who came out in favor of the bond issue that helped us improve all of the branches, including uh, connecting all of our libraries with high-speed fiber optic broadband. Um, here's the downtown library. Uh, this is a picture I wanted to show now because it will come back, but this was opening day of the uh, wonderful grand opening of the downtown library. And there was an announcement that day uh, that Jeff Cole made that there was a family from Iowa that traveled to every library 
major public library of every county uh, in the country. Uh, they had some wealth. They liked the fact that Fort Wayne's genealogy collection was the second largest in the country. And they gave $1.3 million, this is a Iowa couple, to the Fort Wayne Library to support our genealogy research. Again, leadership matters. Here's our branches, 13 of them, all redeveloped and rebuilt almost 20 years ago, now under a rebuilding. And of course, we're gonna think a lot about the things Kelvin talked about. Um, I talked to the chief financial officer yesterday of the library system. By the way, Fort Wayne is looking for an executive director or head libra a librarian. So Kelvin, if some of your friends or others are interested, we're, we're, uh, we're looking back in my hometown. Um, so these are the branches, um, but I want to tell this story quickly. So uh, Mayor Daly, the Urban Libraries Association, invited librarians and mayors to come to a conference in Chicago talking about libraries as anchors for community-based economic development. So we had a very old library that needed to be rebuilt called the Pontiac Branch, and Jeff there, at that time, the city council member next to me, um, it, we said, let's take and relocate the library to be a cluster of services in the census tract area with the lowest income population. And so we created a link to our public transportation hub. We created an after school learning program, a preschool learning program. We partnered with Zion and St. Pete, a Catholic church and Lutheran church. We did a redevelopment of housing in that area. We, in a sense, took an area which had the highest concentration of low income single moms and converted it to a service plaza. And that library, along with this one, another branch, ended up having some of the highest service levels of any of our libraries because of the needs of individuals in the community. Um, again, this will be changed. The library is now, like Kelvin said, this is an older picture, um, but we know that access is critical. Um, and whether it's your public access uh, TV station, your community cable access, which is located in the library, or whether it's the new use of apps to be able to connect the library user with the digital checkout process and the delivery to the sidewalk. I was just informed that all the libraries in Fort Wayne are now open. Uh, they are um, making sure that they have the appropriate protocols that Kelvin talked about. Um, so let me just conclude by uh, this particular challenge. At this particular time, there is a community collaborative hunger. There is a desire for rebuilding trust relationships. And there's a desire to be of help and be of service. So I believe that our libraries and our librarians can be wired and inspired community partners to help us retain and gain jobs, which will be on the mind of every local state and federal public official, particularly if we continue to have uh, the highest levels of unemployment. So why do we do this? And this is son of a friend of mine that worked for the city. I just love taking this because yes, trails and greenways, parks, um, infrastructure, water, sewer, um, building schools are important. But there's this infrastructure that leads to a life for that young man to grow up and be able to get a job, to prosper, to see an opportunity mm -hmm. for him and his family to be. And so with that, I'm going to um, exit the screen share and come back to you and it's the same place at the bottom where you had screen share unshare oh okay hit that thank you um stop share there i am i'm back and Fantastic. so uh, before we go to the q a and i really want to have this be an interaction with kelvin and everybody on the line I want to pose three prospects, three ways in which uh, I'm aware that 
we are seeing the use of digital platforms using machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, we're, we're seeing the capability of these digital platforms to do all kinds of amazing things, new learning systems, new training. So let me take an example. There is a, a great young woman from Fort Wayne who has developed a platform called Club 720. What does it do? It is a hub on an app, on a phone, for people who are struggling to get their FICA score above 720. Because if they can do that, they then have the potential to participate in building equity, buying a home, borrowing money to start a business. And she's using individual development accounts to help do that, which is a tax advantage way that a saver <coughs> put money into an account and others match that account, particularly a low income but working person. And they can then use that money for post high school learning. Mm. They can use that money to do other things as well as mm. buy you couple that with another area, and, and I'm going to get to why libraries are so important to this, because in all of these cases, people are now going to be turning to digital support and learning. Maybe the mom with the two kids at her home um, or in her apartment uh, working is going to only have time at 10 o'clock at night or five o'clock in the morning to be able to continue her journey on learning to build uh, the up, up the savings and the capability to all only buy a home. And, and so veterans, let me talk about that for a minute. So there's another organization that I'm a, a mentor for, I'm supporting, and that organization is called Warriors to Wireless, and they have trained 3,000 veterans to be able to get uh, jobs in the broadband technology field. So they have a, a highly focused training program that's both on in a platform and in in person and they are trained to install wireless broadband systems the developer of this training system has also identified hundreds of thousands of veteran services organizations think for a minute of a um a veterans vfw post uh, you know there are many of them particularly in the fort wayne area and they've been making their um, expenses, paying the expenses of operating the facility on, you know, beer, pizza, and bingo, all of which has been curtailed. Well, think for a minute if that could become in, in a revenue gener generator to put a 5G small cell uh, wireless antenna a system. And then, because I'm very involved in the clean economy, clean energy space, you take the parking lots and you put solar canopies on the parking lots, you put in electric vehicle charging stations, all of which can produce some, some revenue for the veterans, you create your Club 720 to help the veterans be able to learn, get their post high school education, use their GI Bill, and build up enough equity to be able to buy a home and they get all this coaching. And so all of a sudden, the library could be a partner with the veterans post in bringing those same sorts of services. Um, we still have you know, families, as we all know, who drive up to the Walmart, drive up to one of the Fort Wayne branches after hours, park their car nearby and use the broadband. And so, one of the things that the Fort Wayne Community Schools is doing in the library is they're lending out hotspots. Uh, and, and, and with the school corporation, school corporations making available hotspots to every family that does not have in-home adequate broadband. Well, so as you build these partnerships of trust, collaboration, communication, think about reaching out to those within your library sphere of influence who are going to go after the billions of dollars of infrastructure funding by coming up with these creative community collaborations 
and helping to write the grants and provide the support, the library can be at the table where when the budget cuts come, the value of the library and the library systems, are, the value is so clear to those budget cutters that the libraries are not the first to be cut because they're providing this sort of recovery uh, service that's important for bringing in revenue and supporting uh, the uh, continued recovery and resilience after we come back into a more full economy. Don, thank you very much and I'm happy to answer questions or have a good discussion here with a lot of people who are on the line have much more knowledge about libraries than I do and I'm delighted to just be a part of this conversation. Thank you. That's wonderful, Graham. A, a, a beautiful job at, at uh, tying together so many different attributes and aspects of, of what uh, the country and the world in general are, are facing in as changes are kind of forced upon us from budgetary to health and so forth. Uh, you, your point about trust, I, I, I don't think can be overstated. It's a precious commodity uh, that libraries have that indeed they can leverage. Of course, they have to be extremely careful with it, but it's, it's, in, it's in high and growing demand. I mean, what's, where is trust for the internet, right? It's collapsing. Where's trust for politics? Where's trust for our, you know, our, our, our economics, uh, our, our finance? All, all the, our systems are, are declining from a lack of trust. And so, turning to the library is a natural thing that people do. They don't even have to think about it almost. So where can libraries come into that, uh, come into that and, and play an increasing role? The infrastructure point is right on. Uh, it ties very much, I mean, thinking in those terms and thinking about budgetary challenges, I think is exactly the right thing to be doing because you're right, if we are lucky, Early next year, we will see something like a major piece of legislation. And, you know, we, I say major, you know, we've passed a couple of trillion dollar uh, uh, bills uh, in, the, in the past few months. Uh, but uh, uh, another one related to infrastructure has been talked about for so long and it has not been done. All of our traditional infrastructures in the U.S. are, are degrading. People from China come in and say, is this the United States? I can't believe it. You know, potholes everywhere, you know. Uh, so it, it's coming, and the role that libraries will play in that is significant, not just communications, but as we talk about the social infrastructure, which is kind of the hardest thing to put a, put a finger on. So let's, let's open this up. Uh, anybody, any questions? Uh, uh, Kelvin, you have any questions for Graham or vice versa? I don't have any questions from Graham. I think... Uh... We, 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 we complimented each other well. And I actually, Graham, I do know where Fort Wayne, Indiana is. I've been there many, many times. I actually have family that, uh, that resided there for years and, and, and worked, in the, uh, worked in the community. And you, you actually may know, uh, may know them. Thank he you, Kelvin. Does. He was mayor. He knew everybody. <laughs> Kelvin, I've got a question for you. Can I, can I jump sure. in there? Sure. Yeah, uh, Kelvin. One of the things that we're finding um, now is librarians, you have so much on your plate. You know, to be a community leader, you've got to first, of course, make sure everybody is safe and all your employees are, are being well taken care of. My question is, do you have at this point and, 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 and increasingly when the, the, uh, the budget gets decided, and the resources get divided in Broward County. Um, are you at that table? And if so, how are you finding that working out? And what, what would you like to do more to, to see that you know, the library's position is well understood by those who have an impact on resources? So um, we just wrapped up our budget hearings on this past Tuesday. Uh, for the county and our uh, the the recommended budget was actually approved um, the the libraries actually um, we did uh, I would say well in the in the process uh, our budget will um, increase actually by about a percentage and a half um, 
so we didn't face any cuts. Uh, I did have to, uh, or I didn't have to, but I, what I, there was an, a vacant position that had been on my books for about five years and it was needed by the county. So I, 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 I gave that position with the, with the opportunity that I would get it back in the future or that we'll get it back in the future. So that was about $115,000, but otherwise we did well. Uh, all of our construction projects, our capital projects, were also uh, approved. We're in the, actually in the midst of a main library um, master plan um, and being executed. Um, there's a terrace project. I'm, my, my office is, we have eight terraces here, eight floors. Uh, we've had our terrace project continue while COVID is back, actually going on. Um, so I would say as compared to a lot of my library uh, folks, um, we did well. Um, I, we, we're, we're lucky, uh, I think, that we have on our county commission a, um, uh, a, a librarian. He actually was a uh, media specialist working in the Broward County Schools. He sits on the commission, so he's a big supporter of libraries, of course. And what, you know, what we've been doing throughout um, the um, throughout COVID, which actually has me at the has me at the table, is that we have provided resources and support staff to support our emergency operations center, our call center. We're also helping out with our CARES rental assistance program, and so libraries and library staff have been um, contributing, and it's definitely been. Um, it's welcoming and, you know, we get mentioned quite often positively at the county commission meetings. We, we created masks and other uh, PPE for the community as well. And um, when we're deciding on our, our budget, um, I, I sit down with the county administrator and we go through the things that I'm, that I'm asking for. And um, again, I was lucky enough to get pretty much everything that I was requesting, at least in this budget cycle. Way to go. Oh, great. Uh, your, uh, your point about being at the table, uh, uh, Graham or, or uh, Kelvin, I, I think is a really good one. And, and it makes me, reminds me of, of a specific infrastructure uh, where it's important to be at the table. And so a lot of the policy now uh, is forming at the state level. The states are rising up in their importance, both in, the, in, in, in making grants and also you know, a set of regulations from health to, to broadband. And so every state, now every, every elected official has a broadband plank in their platform. They just, it's just, you can't be credible as a public official and not know and care something and advocate for broadband. And every state pretty much has a broadband commission or a task force or something like that. And we had a, a librarian from Abilene, Texas on uh, a couple of months ago, who's just been appointed to the state broadband commission. And that made me think every single state commission around broadband should have a librarian on that commission because, you know, one in three adults has accessed the internet at a library. I mean, 80 million people rely on libraries for internet access, not entirely, but at least in part. So it's extremely important and especially for the people that have no other place to go. So it's an advocacy for a librarian to, you know, get appointed to that kind of a commission. And I, I would lean on the state library to be your advocate to do that if you can. And so everybody kind of think about that because it's gonna be important for, uh, for policy and funding and, and the rest of it. I had a question for, uh, for uh, Kelvin before we close here, uh, but I have forgotten it. So, <laughs> oh, no. Well, actually I did. It's not, it's not a big finishing question, but it related to uh, children. Uh, and and you, you talked about opening up uh, spaces for children. So are, is, is that a different uh, consideration? Do you have a different rule for children's space? I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of taking the approach that the young children are less vulnerable and it's safer. It's important for them to be together physically 
and can we do that? Are you are you segmenting gathering? For, for right, yeah, for right now, Don, um, I mentioned you know temporarily um, not having our our meetings and um, uh, programs. Um, that includes the children's programming as well, story times as well. Uh, we also um, uh, when we do open up our children's, uh, specifically our children's spaces, we won't have the, the toys and, you know, those manipulatives available um, right, 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 uh, right now. We're going to uh, uh, wait for a while to, to bring those back. Um, you know, especially for the young children. And um, we, when, when we, um, you know, when COVID first hit, I mean, people were talking about it. So you're talking February, March, or at least here in the U.S., you know, when it became more, we became more aware, we removed all of our toys and manipulatives then. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, first we tried to increase the cleanliness and, you know, wiping them down more and all of that, but then we just decided to remove them. And I think that's going to be a while before we, before we bring them, before we bring them back. Cause you know, kids could put things in their mouths and you know, all this other stuff. And, you know, the protocols that we also had taken um, was, you know, and this was in February was that we were going to increase our, cleanliness of our library locations, our children's areas, just because of the flu. So this was, you know, prior to where we are with PPE, um, that, uh, that I was making some decisions then, you know, then about uh, just making our libraries cleaner and safer for, for the community. Good, good. Well, I, I think it's going to be a topic we'll come back to, you know, uh, services for children as opposed to everybody else. I think it's a big topic, but I'll, I'm going to close with a, a question from, uh, from uh, Sean McLaughlin uh, and something related, you mentioned related to uh, broadcasting, public broadcasting and, and uh, uh, public media. Do you see a role, uh, a different role for, for your library and libraries in general in, in uh, public media and, and so-called public broadcasting? Uh, yes, I actually started a response to Sean um, Knight and the Knight Foundation has been engaging with library leaders for the past few years and really communicating um, you know, with us and, and vice versa about, um, you know, news and uh, particularly fake news and how to identify fake news and the library's role, our role in um, being um, you know, the voice and, you know, the, the information, the information professionals that we are. And so I, I don't know if libraries can, re, you know, can rebuild or replace local media, but we certainly have a role in making sure that, you know, we are, as, as, as Cheryl actually just says, we are the remedy to fake news. I would, I would say that's our role is to make sure that we get the, news out there that is uh, accurate and uh you know that's our role and, that, and it has been our role and certainly you know during this day and time continues to be more important that we are uh you know doing that uh yet it, we come back to trust once again <laughs> you know uh <laughs> Trusted news. Where can I get trusted news? Uh, you know, it's not on TV anymore. Uh, where can I, you know, so my big takeaways today are trust and that, that, that the library is really the hub of trust. You know, it's most trusted institution and it touches so many other areas, not just kind of trusted, you know, in a specific way or like healthcare or something, but in general, in general. And so that's that's could not be more important. It's more important every single day as it's declining everywhere else. And the other one relates to infrastructure and the preparation for what's coming. And a uh, uh, to, to Graham's point, these you know billions of dollars that have to go into infrastructure, a lot of which is going to go into communications infrastructure, and 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 that will find its way to to libraries. So you know, be thinking about that. Be ready because when when these new bills come down, these new funds come available, 
the people that are shovel ready, you know, that have thought through a whole project and a plan and have a proposal for it, just go right to the front because there's just no time to do the things in the normal way. So be optimistic, be ready. Uh, the new year is coming, we hope. Uh, there's more to talk about. We'll hang around as we usually do after we close the recording, but I think we'll call that uh, a session for today. So we'll close the recording right now. But before we do, I'd like everybody to unmute. Can everybody unmute? Unmute. Everybody, everybody unmute. Lydia, Lorena, Rhonda, everybody, Sulin. I'd like to give our speakers, Kelvin and, and Graham, uh, a round of applause for some excellent content today. Thank you very much. Aloha. Okay, thank you, Stephen. That was kind of